That's the reason why you have a founder's agreement in place. Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, legal educator and international attorney Komal Shah tears down a generic founder's agreement. As Kamal says, these documents can either set healthy expectations or create a divisive fight. How you draft a founder's agreement can define the growth of a young company. So let's tear it down. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. The purpose of this show is exactly what it sounds like. We take contracts, we beat them up. We're often mean, occasionally nice and supportive to our loving contracts, but not usually. Usually we're pretty mean. Uh, today, I'm here with my friend Kamal Shah. Kamal, how are you today? I'm great and excited to be here. I'm excited. Well, I mean, as excited as a person can get about contracts, right? Uh, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about this document. This is a founder's agreement. Uh, and we're using sort of a general version because these tend to be very private documents. But we're going to go through this. Uh, Kamal, why are we talking about this document? What's important about it? When are lawyers likely to see it? Uh, and, and why should they pay attention to this conversation about a founder's agreement? Yeah, well, see, if you if you look at the startup scene, it's exploding everywhere around the world. And you would want that the founders of a startup uh, function uh, in, in, in harmony and they don't have conflicts and they don't have issues down the road. Like, you know, uh, you're doing better than me or like, you know, he is getting more instead of putting in less work. Mm -hmm. This kind of issues can arise. So you want to put something in an agreement uh, to get to get the contribution, to record the contribution, to record what they're going to get from the business down the line, um, even it, before it's incorporated and ensure that there are no conflicts. And that's the reason why you have a founder's agreement in place. Well, we're going to talk about sort of the social function of this thing and whether this document actually brings founders together or tears them apart. Uh, I might even make an analogy to a prenup uh, and marriage, though probably not a great analogy. Uh, but before I do, tell me about uh, tell us about you, Kamal. What's your background? What are you bringing to this document? Where are you seeing them? Uh, I'm a lawyer and a charter secretary, and I've helped quite a lot of startups uh, get going. So like help them through the way in all their uh, incorporation requirements, formation requirements, their basic registrations, their basic contracts. Uh, I've helped uh, them a lot of startups through this. And I've seen that there can be issues which can arise later on between the founders if they don't have something like an agreement. Uh, basically, I work with LawSeco, which is uh, a leading ed tech in India. I'm one of the co-founders of that startup. So I also kind of understand how co-founders feel and what is the thought that they put into uh, in growing a business. Right. And that's how, like, you know, I believe uh, I can work through founders agreements. And I've been married for 20 years. And so, you know, I know exactly how this goes to. Um, uh, the only ship that don't sail is a partnership, as Dave Ramsey occasionally says. So we're going to see if we can make this ship sail. Uh, let's go into the document, Kamal, uh, starting at the ownership of the company. You wanted to talk about the shares and the way the shares are divided. Uh, you, you know, I'm assuming that when these companies are starting, there's really not much to divide. So you're sort of talking about things yeah. in the abstract. So tell me about how you think through this ownership of the company section. This is section five in the document. Yeah. So uh, what happens in the beginning is that you don't actually have an incorporated entity yet, but you're starting a business uh, with the belief that you're going to get a good deal of return. You, your idea is going to take off and you're going to make a, a truckload of money. That's how you start off. But then um, before you incorporate an entity and actually get to document your shares and everything, you would want an agreement in place um, on what is going to be the share that someone will take once the uh, company gets incorporated. Because you're gonna be putting efforts right in the beginning, even before anything happens. You, you're gonna start putting the efforts. You're, you're gonna start arranging things. So people want to know what is going to be the return for, um, for which they're working. And that's the reason why the share or 
what is the ownership the founder each of the founders is going to have is very very important uh, it's more important because it's very difficult also to determine that x will have x number of shares because he is putting x number of hours or is contributing x number of things uh, because someone can be putting in four hours and generating you know a lot of sales and someone can be working for the whole day and make it it find it very difficult to move something so that's why like you know arriving at a very objective mechanism of share in the ownership is a little bit difficult people use different tools for this like you know a founders by calculator and all of that um, and assign weight to do the kind of work or hours or the results generated and that's how they decide the shares uh, but that's why this clause becomes critical because people need to know what they're working for Hey, everybody. I'm Mike Whalen. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contract Teardown Show. Real quick, I want to ask you to do me slash you really a quick favor. Look down below. You'll see a discount code to join the Law Insider premium subscription. When you do that, you get access to more content like this. You'll see webinars, daily tips on contract drafting, not to mention access to the world's largest database of sample contracts and clauses. It will help you write better contracts faster. If you want to do it right now, there's a code below, so get there. Also, if you're part of a larger team, if you're in-house or in a law firm, just email us. We're at sales at lawinsider.com. We'll make sure you get a deal as well. Come join us in the community. The code is below. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I wonder if there's any way to do this. I, like Again, I'm thinking of my own partnership experience, uh, including my marriage. And, you know, at the beginning of the marriage, you think we're going to have date night every week and our kids are never going to be the kinds of kids who scream in the store, right? It's all this sort of sunny. Uh, but then when you're asked to sit down and do the math of like, what's the relative contribution, uh, that can be quite freighted. Uh, thinking about six, uh, vesting, talk to me about how the vesting happens and what the relationship is with that stock division. Uh, in five. Talk to me about section six. Yeah, so section six, if you look at a vesting schedule or when people will actually start to get the rights to the shares, uh, it's very important on what is the timing at which you're entering into a founder's agreement because um, although founder's agreements usually tend to be entered into before an incorporated entity comes into place, you can also have it after the incorporated entity is in place just as a measure of internal understanding between the founders because you have your constitution documents of the company but that talks about the um, functioning or the mechanism or the relationship between the company and the shareholders while this is something that talks about the relationship between the founders so you can also have it when it's incorporated and when you do it after it's incorporated westing is a little bit easy because you're going to put like you know uh, from the date when you have been allotted the shares it's x date um uh, you know this much period of time a year or two years down the line is when you're going to have all the rights to the shares it's a little bit difficult when you're doing it without the entity in place because you don't know when the shares are actually going to come into existence so you either might want to bring it a little bit later when the company is formed or you might want to uh, define the dates as the date from which the shares get allotted Right. So that's something that you want to put in Westing. Westing is basically when you get all the rights to the shares. Right. That's it. And the percentage of rights. Well, and there's a section below about what happens if the if, a, you know, the agreement gets broken yeah. up or a founder gets terminated in some way. Uh, what happens to the shares? Talk to us about that. That terminated founder shares section. Yeah. So uh, if a share, if a founder has uh, shares and you know they they get terminated because, and interestingly, I've had loads of discussions with startup founders on how are you going to fire a shareholder? You know, you can fire a founder, you cannot let them participate in the management decisions, but how are you going to fire uh, a shareholder? It's very difficult to fire them. Yeah. So either you can buy back their shares, you know, if the law of the place allows you to buy back the shares, or you can kind of mandate them to transfer it to somebody else okay so when they're they say to be a founder they must transfer their shares to someone else or if you know the whole lot of them is transferring their shares to an investor then there's a drag along right and they would have to transfer it to an investor something like that so that's how you kind of get the shares back into the fold from the person who's dominating the relationship mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this. Uh, it talks about a majority vote of the founders. And I assume usually when this kind of document is created, there's only two, right? Uh, but it seems to really be targeted to the time at which the company is farther down the road, right? Like they've, they've got investors, they've yeah. got money, there's yeah. probably more shares mm -hmm. that have been assigned at that point. And so that, that kind of sentence probably makes more sense then, a little less sense early. Yeah. Uh, jumping down to seven and the management rights, again, this is one of the major decisions uh, with an agreement like this. How are you thinking about Section 7 and the management rights? So there are certain decisions that you want to put uh, in the business of uh, the company, which should be taken ideally with the consent or with uh, you know the agreement all of, of all of the founders. Now, for example, you're going to talk of raising capital. You you're going to bring in the third party. You want to have the consent of all the founders. So you you might want to define certain decisions where it's essential that both the, all the founders that are there unanimously agree towards it. Uh, you can also define decisions which will be taken by a majority of the founders. Mm -hmm. So uh, decisions which are really, 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 really critical to the existence of the company. Uh, you know, let someone wants to dissolve the company or things like that, like very critical to the business. You want to take that with the unanimous consent of all the founders. When you're talking of decisions which are um, a part of the business, you know, they're going to support let's say you're going to make investment into some projects or you're going to buy some property or um, you, you know you're going to employ or hire someone at a very high level something like that those decisions you can put uh, as uh, as something where a majority of the founders should agree but decisions which are business critical you can put uh, as unanimous decisions you might also want to divide or segregate the responsibilities one of the founders will look at marketing and then there is a finance guy and then there is a hardcore sales guy, you might want to divide that in your agreement also just for clarity's sake. Yeah, I was thinking about like Section 8 talks about identifying the different founder responsibilities because otherwise you're going to end yeah. up with seven, you know, a majority of founders are required yeah, yeah. to do to take out the trash, right? But the to divide the responsibilities gives you some space to to sort of section out the kinds of decisions and, and assign some gravity yeah. to those decisions, which makes sense. Uh, jump down to nine, to fiduciary duties. Uh, talk to me about how the founders have, you know, assigned these fiduciary duties to each other. Yeah, so uh, what happens here is that, you know, it's you, the basic fiduciary duty element in these things is, is, is that, you know, you don't want to profit personally from the functioning of the business. That's just one thing that's uh, very relevant. You don't want to do or you don't want to carry on activities which are against the interest of the business. Like you um, come out of the business and set up shop, which is in a direct competition with the business. That's something that's going to, going to impact it, right? So basic duties would be like, you know, not carrying out a direct business, which is in direct competition without the consent of the founders, not trying to do anything that will uh, give them a, give somebody a personal gain as against you know a gain to the business as a whole so these are just basically some uh, fiduciary uh, points or elements of the duties of the founders right, right. Yeah, but you see uh, a little bit below uh, a, a bit of clarification on, you know, if somebody owns a mutual fund or something, and so they've got a very small chunk of ownership of a competing company, there's a line that says the ownership of 1% or less of the securities of any publicly traded company will not be considered participation in a competitive business or activity. Do you think this is enough to clarify what participation means, or should they add more to clarify that point? Um, you can, you can see, you can define this how you want it. You want to make it a very restrictive condition or restrictive terms. Sometimes courts will not agree with that. If you want to ban them completely from, you know, investing in any kind of competing business. And let's say you're stopping them from doing businesses which are even related to the business and not exactly direct competition and you're restricting them from doing it in all geographies mm -hmm. so that's something that's very wide and unreasonable that's not going to work uh, you want to make it really specific like saying businesses which are in direct competition with the company or you know um, uh, specific geography or uh, or you know which is in this business itself so ownership of like you know 
companies, 1% is something where you're not going to be able to impact the decisions of the other business. So you might want to put that, that, uh, you know, you shouldn't be able to impact or influence the decisions of that specific business, yeah. whether it's by 1% ownership, whether it's by being a director on the board, uh, board, or whether it's being by a really influential consultant in whatever ways. You don't want to be in a position where you're really able to influence and drive a competent, competing business. So that's the element. So you might want to extend this actually to uh, a situation where someone is a director or someone is a really influential consultant. Yeah, I don't think uh, anybody is worried that uh, the CEO of Disney is going to call me and ask my opinion to, you know, hurt my own company for my tiny shares in the Disney Corporation. Uh, let's jump down to uh, this bit about confidentiality clauses. Um, how are you dealing with company IP and those kinds of uh, sharing information from inside of the company? What, what do you want to see? What do you and don't you see in this document? Uh, I would want to ensure that definitely um, elements which are very crucial to the business, like the business model, uh, specific processes, product development plans, these kinds of things are kept very, very confidential. Now, um, you want to be very careful, even when you are speaking to the public, even when you are speaking to some of the junior colleagues, even when you are speaking to, you know, let's say your business associates that you don't divulge this information, which is really, 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 really critical, like, you know, business models or product development plans or major customers and the terms with customers, things like this are very, very uh, crucial. So it's important how you define confidential information in um, in the agreement. You don't want to make anything and everything confidential because, in fact, for a founder, it's a little bit essential that they go and talk about their business to different people. But elements which can actually uh, result in a damage to the business, like a business model or an impending product plan or a customer list or terms with customers. These things you don't want to divulge at any place. Yeah, jumping down to 11, it talks about the resignation and removal of founders. And I just got to read this sentence because it's fantastic. Uh, any founder may resign from the company by giving written notice to the other founders. And here's the sentence. A majority of founders may remove another founder from the company at any time for any reason or no reason at all by giving written notice to such founder. Obviously, when you've got two founders, right, you, you know, you can't have a majority. There's no, it's 50-50, but, it, you know, yeah. you can see you get a love triangle of a third person into this company and real quick, the drama gets really reality TV really yeah. fast. What do you think about the language in this resignation and removal section? Uh, I do not think that you can, you should give a blanket, uh, blanket uh, right to, you know, the other founders just to remove the founder just like that. Cause it may happen that actually the, the will and get, gets together and, and removes the hero out of like, you know, and they, they're driving the business after that just for their own benefits. Like, you know, you, you don't want to do that. So you want to ensure that uh, at least an adequate opportunity is given to any founder to, uh, to be heard to the other founders and then their views are actually documented like that's it that's normal fair it's like just natural justice that you give someone an opportunity to uh, to explain themselves and to put uh, put down their views uh, into the document having said that if it's a board of directors and a majority votes against you you're going to have you you're going to get out it's going to be very difficult even for the person to function afterwards if the if the feeling of the rest of the people is that they don't want to cooperate and you know this person is the ugly duckling of the lot then yeah. It becomes very difficult for that person, even if he stays, to fun uh, to function. But definitely, there should be an opportunity that's given. And you also give a specific period of notice. You can't just say a written notice, like you know, here it is, it's delivered to you, and you're out. Like you can't say you got it like an that. Email. You're out, period. Carl. Yeah. 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 No. Well, so, and I mean, you know, thinking big picture, you look at this document. It's only five pages, right? So. You know, with yeah. this kind of relationship, this is sort of more laying out principles than it is trying yeah. to imagine every possible. And so um, I'm thinking about the social function of a document like this in, you know, when I 
did mediations in, in, in business and in family law, what I would always say is you want to pre-litigate so you don't have to re-litigate. So let's decide this stuff now so you don't fight it out in court later. And that's sort of a function of a document like this is let's think about the future. But of course, as soon as you start pre-litigating, you're like introducing drama into the relationship yeah. before it was even there. So thinking about this document, do how do you as a lawyer, as a practicing lawyer, trying to get this relationship consummated through this document, how do you use this document as a way to strengthen the relationship as opposed to kill it before it starts? Yeah. So basically, these founders agreements also uh, also work on setting the expectations and setting the tone that, you know, this is what we agree. Uh, we'll dedicate ourselves to the business. It's not like, you know, someone has to stop us from going out and doing that. We'll do that. We'll give our IP. We'll give this. We'll contribute this. That's the sense of the document rather than, you know, um, two or three of them stopping the other person from doing that. It sets the expectation right at the beginning because, you know, it's a joint agreement. People are agreeing to uh, to to bring a business and to scale it and to profit from it. Right. So that's how you do it. And um, when you're doing it, you want to ensure that uh, when you're setting it, when you're putting it, you want to ensure terms. You want to ensure to put wordings which are not really restrictive and which don't sound like, hey, I'm making you do this rather than, you know, let's do this. That should be the tone of the document. You want to use language like this, that let's have that. OK, so that's the language kind of language or the um, environment that you want to set when you're putting or drafting the document. Yeah, I I'm, it's make again the bad analogy. I'm thinking of I, I remember talking to a lawyer uh, about uh, prenup, about prenuptial agreements. And what he advised his clients was revisit this after every major life event, right? So don't try to rely on this document for the entirety of your relationship, yeah. revisit yeah. this. And so for a document like this, I'm thinking this is pretty bare bones. And yes, it sets some expectations, which is important yeah. because you know yeah. harm is a breach of expectations. And so by making them clear yeah. early, you can define yeah. what those are. But, you know, also, this is pretty slim and, you know, this it's is probably slim, a document yeah. that you your company's worth jack all when you start. Right. It's not worth anything. But yeah. as you go on. Things are going to happen. Yeah. Revisit these kinds of agreements as you go on. I think it's really smart. Just get the company moving and you can dig into the drama later. So for people who want to reach out to you, Kamal, I appreciate you running through this. For people who want to reach out to you, learn more about what you do, uh, about uh, your learning company, uh, what's the best way to connect with you? The best way to reach uh, me is my email ID, which is kamal at ipleaders.in. I can leave it um, with you. And that's that's the best time. Like, I'm, I'm on that email all the while. Yeah, that's... That's sad. You, don't you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm there on LinkedIn as well. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Also, I'm there. So uh, both of their both of those platforms is I am there on Reddit too. But like you know, LinkedIn and email ID is where I regularly. Uh, I'm regularly there, so you can awesome. reach out on that. Well, we'll share that information at uh, at the blog post at lawinsider.com slash resources, where we will post this video uh, and all of Kamal's information. Also, if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show, just email us at community at lawinsider.com. We would be happy to have you. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you guys on the next Contract Teardown Show. Have a good day. Thank you, Mike. And thanks, everybody.